Bonjour, hi, as we say in Quebec. From time to time, we all ask some deep and difficult questions. Why is the world filled with trouble? How can we make it better? How do we add meaning and purpose to our lives? Well, as difficult as these questions are, many people have answers to them. For example, morality is dictated by God in holy scriptures. When all of the world obeys his laws, the world will be perfect. Or problems are the fault of evil people who must be shamed, punished, and defeated. Or our tribe must claim its rightful greatness under the control of a strong leader who embodies its authentic virtue. Or in the past, we lived in a state of order and harmony until alien forces brought on decadence and degeneration. We must restore the society to its golden age. Well, what about the rest of us? Many people know what they don't believe in, but have a harder time identifying what they do believe in. In Enlightenment Now, Le Triomphe des Lumières, I argue that there is a, an alternative system of beliefs and values, the one that we associate with uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, namely, that we can use knowledge to improve human flourishing. Many people embrace the ideals of the Enlightenment without being able to name or describe them. As a result, they've faded into the background as a kind of bland status quo or establishment or default. The other ideologies have passionate uh, advocates, and I suggest that Enlightenment ideals too need a, an explicit defense and a positive commitment. That's what I have tried to do in uh, Enlightenment now. The Enlightenment, I suggest, centers on four themes, reason, science, humanism, and progress. Uh, let me say a few words about each. It all begins in reason, with the understanding that traditional sources of belief are generators of delusion. Faith, revelation, tradition, authority, charisma, mysticism, intuition, the hermeneutic parsing or exegesis of sacred texts are all ways of being wrong. Uh, reason, in comparison, is non-negotiable. As soon as you try to provide reasons why we should trust anything other than reason, as soon as you explain why you're right or why other people should <laughs> believe you, why you're not lying or full of crap, you've lost the argument because you have appealed to reason. Now, as a cognitive psychologist, as I uh, know many people in this room are, uh, I would be the first to acknowledge that human beings on their own are not particularly reasonable. Uh, we generalize from anecdotes. We reason from stereotypes. People uh, seek evidence that confirms their beliefs, and they blow off evidence that disconfirms them. And we're all overly confident about our own knowledge, our wisdom, and our virtue. But people are capable of reason if they adopt certain norms. Free speech, open criticism and debate, logical analysis, fact checking, and empirical testing, which leads to the second enlightenment value, science. Science is based on the conviction that the world is intelligible and that we can understand it by formulating possible explanations and testing them against reality. Science has shown itself to be our most reliable means of understanding the world, including ourselves. An important enlightenment ideal was that there can be a science of human nature and that beliefs about society are testable just like other beliefs about the world. Uh, Science, moreover, provides not just technical know-how, but deep insights about the human condition. Naturalism. The universe has no goal or purpose that is relevant to uh, human well-being, with the implication that if we want to improve that well-being, we have to do it ourselves. Entropy. Entropy. 
In a closed system without input of uh, energy, disorder increases. Things fall apart, stuff happens. Not because the universe has anything against us, but just because there are so many more ways for things to go wrong than for things to go right. Evolution. Humans are the product of a competitive process which selects for reproductive success, not for well-being. As Immanuel Kant put it, out of the crooked timber of humanity, no truly straight thing can be built. The third ideal is humanism, that the ultimate moral goal is to reduce the suffering and enhance the flourishing of human beings and other conscious creatures. Well, improving human well-being, who could be against that, you might think? Well, in fact, there are alternatives to humanism, such as that the ultimate good is to uh, enhance the glory of the tribe, the nation, the race, the class, or the faith, to obey the dictates of a divinity and pressure other people to do the same, to achieve feats of heroic greatness, or to advance some mystical force or dialectic or struggle or pursuit of a utopian or messianic age. Humanism is feasible because people have a sense of uh, sympathy or empathy or compassion, a concern with the well-being of others. By default, the circle of our sympathy is rather small. Uh, we tend to feel the pain only of our biological relatives, our uh, close allies, our friends, maybe cute little baby animals, uh, but that's about it. However, the circle of sympathy can be expanded through the forces of cosmopolitanism, education, journalism, art, mobility, and even reason itself. As soon as you enter into a discussion with someone else, you ca uh, I can't insist that my interests count and yours don't just because I'm me and you're not and hope for you to take me seriously. Uh, the very act of exchanging ideas presupposes a, a interchangeability of viewpoints, which means that other people's interests have to count as much as your own. Finally, we get the ideal of progress, that if we use knowledge and sympathy to reduce suffering and enhance flourishing, we can gradually succeed. Now, you may ask, if human nature doesn't change, how could progress even be possible? And an answer from the Enlightenment is that it's possible through benign institutions, which allow us to deploy uh, energy and knowledge to uh, push back against entropy, that in, in, in enhance the better angels of our nature, as Abraham Lincoln put it, such as reason and sympathy, while marginalizing our inner demons, our illusions, our biases, our tribalism, our uh, taste for dominance and revenge. What do I mean by benign institutions? Well, some of the gifts of the Enlightenment include democracy, declarations of rights, markets, organizations for global cooperation, and institutions for seeking the truth, including universities, scientific societies, and a free press. So, 250 years later, how did that Enlightenment thing work out? Well, I have found that if you ask most intellectuals, the answer is not very well, because most intellectuals hate progress. And intellectuals who call themselves progressive really hate progress. If you think that we can solve problems, I have been told, that means that you have a blind faith and a quasi-religious belief in the outmoded superstition of the false promise of the myth of the onward march of inevitable progress. You are a cheerleader or a groupie for vulgar American can-do-ism with the rah-rah spirit of boardroom ideology, Silicon Valley, and the Chamber of Commerce. You are a practitioner of Whig history, a naive optimist, a Pollyanna, and of course a Pangloss, alluding to the Voltaire character who declared, all is for the best in the best of all possible worlds. <laughs> 
Well, by modern standards, Professor Pangloss was a pessimist. A true optimist would believe there could be much better worlds than the one that we see today. But all of this is irrelevant because the question of whether progress has taken place is not a matter of having a, uh, a sunny disposition or wearing rose-colored glasses or seeing the glass as half full. It's an empirical hypothesis. Human well-being can be measured. Life, health, uh, nutrition, prosperity, peace, freedom, safety, knowledge, leisure, happiness. If they have increased over time, I argue that would be progress. Well, let's go to the data. Beginning with the most precious thing of all, life. For most of human history, life expectancy at birth hovered around 30 years. Uh, but then with the invention of vaccination, of sanitation, later of antibiotics, and other advances in public health and medicine, life expectancy on average around the world today is 71 years, and in the uh, richer parts of the world, uh, 81 years. Even in the parts of the world that did not escape from uh, early death uh, at the same time as Europe and the Americas, there has been fantastic progress more recently, including Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. For most of human history, the uh, biggest uh, killer of humans was uh, infant mortality. Uh, and in Sweden in 1750, for example, one third of children did not live to see their fifth birthday. Sweden brought its rate of child mortality down by a factor of 100, and other parts of the world did the same uh, in their uh, sequence. In North America, for example, Canada, in Asia, South Korea, in Latin America, uh, Chile, and in Sub-Saharan Africa, Ethiopia, which has brought the rate of child mortality down from 25% to less than 5% just in 30 years. That's still too high, but the progress is continuing. Mothers, too, were in uh, mortal danger whenever they uh, gave birth. About 1% of Swedish mothers died in childbirth in the 18th century. That was reduced by a factor of about 250, and it happened again in other parts of the world, such as the United States, Malaysia, and Ethiopia. Health. The biggest killer for most of human history was infectious disease, the pathogens that, uh, that eat us from the inside. Uh, in rich countries, Infectious disease is no longer a major killer, but in poor countries, it still kills uh, large numbers of people, particularly children. However, each of the five most dangerous causes of infectious disease have been uh, reduced just in the last 15 years, pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria, measles, and HIV AIDS. Sustenance. For, uh, most of human history, it was impossible to grow, uh, on average, 2,500 2, calories uh, per person per year, which is the amount that is needed by a young, active uh, male. But beginning with the agricultural revolution in Britain in the 18th century, with advances in uh, agronomy, such as crop rotation, later the invention of synthetic fertilizers, the mechanization of agriculture, and selective breeding of vigorous hybrids, England first developed the ability to feed itself, uh, as did the United States and France. More recently, the rest of the world is doing the same. Uh, China, India, here you have the world as a whole. Now, this would be a dubious example of progress if all those calories were just going to make fat people fatter. But in fact, they uh, have reduced the rate of undernourishment, malnutrition, which in 1970 afflicted 35% of people in the developing world. That has been cut in more than half, first in Latin America, then in Asia, and now in Sub-Saharan Africa. The most devastating uh, events uh, caused by insufficient food are famines. Famine has always been a part of the human condition. It, the Bible says it was one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But uh, because of the abundance of food, the rate of famine has been drastically reduced. So that today, famines 
don't take place because of crop failures or insufficient food. They only take place in war zones or the most remote parts of the world where there's difficulty in bringing food to people who need it. Prosperity. For most of human history, there was pretty much no economic growth to speak of. You can see that in a graph showing the gross world product from the year one to the present. And it shows that for more than uh, a millennium and a half, there were, the economic growth was so small that it was less than one pixel high. But then, because of the Industrial Revolution, the advance of technology, the spread of education, the development of institutions like markets and uh, contracts and financial bodies, and then global trade, prosperity has shot up and is now 200 times higher than it was in the 18th century. Now again, one could say this is a questionable example of progress if all of the gains went to the 1% at the top. But um, in fact, the great escape from universal poverty, which was begun in the United States and the United Kingdom and other European countries, of course, including France, has, is now spreading to the rest of the world. There you see South Korea, Chile, China, uh, and India. There's the graph for the world as a whole. And as a result, the rate of extreme poverty uh, has been in decline. Extreme poverty defined as the bare minimum necessary to feed oneself and one's family, $1.90 per person per day. By that standard, 90% of the world lived in extreme poverty 200 years ago. Uh, today, less than 10% of the world lives in extreme poverty. In fact, the rate of extreme poverty has been reduced by 75% just in 30 years. Uh, many economists consider this the greatest accomplishment in all of human history and virtually no one knows about it. Indeed, the United Nations has set the goal of eliminating extreme poverty everywhere by the year 2030. May we live to see the day. As a result, inequality between countries, uh, after necessarily increasing with the Industrial Revolution, when some countries escaped from universal poverty, leaving others behind and widening the gap between the rich and the poor, is now starting to shrink because <coughs> poor countries are getting richer faster than rich countries are getting richer. And so inequality between countries is starting to come down. Now, inequality within rich countries, uh, of course, has increased. But that doesn't mean that rich countries have become indifferent to the needs of the less fortunate, of children, of the elderly, of the sick, uh, of the poor. For most of history, countries devoted no more than 1.5% of their GDP to uh, social spending, redistribution to the needy. But in the 20th century, every country went uh, on a binge of social spending so that today the median country in the OECD redistributes 22% of its income to the poor, the sick, the elderly, and uh, children. You'll note that France is the highest at more than 30% of its uh, GDP, but even countries like the uh, US and Australia reallocate uh, a lot of their wealth to the, to the uh, poor. As a result, even in countries with high inequality, like the United States, the rate of poverty, which is not the same as the rate of inequality, has come down. In 1960, one third of Americans uh, lived in poverty. If you define income in terms of uh, total income, including government benefits, then the poverty rate has fallen from 33% to 7%. And if you measure poverty in terms of what people can afford to buy, the food, clothing, and shelter, it's decreased from 30% to 3%. Peace. For most of history, the natural state of relations between major empires and states was war. And peace was merely a brief interlude between wars. We can see that in a graph that plots the percentage of years that the great powers in, uh, of the day were uh, at each other's throats in uh, major wars. And what the graph shows is that uh, 400, 500 years ago, the great powers were always at war. More recently, they have never been at war. The world has not seen a great power war 
for 65 years since the United States fought China in Korea in uh, 1953. Now, over this, uh, these centuries in which wars were getting shorter and less frequent, uh, the ones that did take place were getting more destructive. And if we zoom in on the 20th century, you can't miss the huge spikes of bloodletting that took place during World War I and World War II. But contrary to predictions that I grew up with, that it would only be a matter of time before World War III would break out, pitting the United States against the Soviet Union with uh, their nuclear weapons, resulting in death tolls that would be even more uh, horrific than World War I and World War II. The Cold War ended, the Soviet Union went out of existence, and World War III never happened. In fact, if we zoom in on the period since the end of World War II, we see there's been a dramatic decline in the number of deaths from all wars combined, including civil wars and, uh, and, and minor wars, from about 22 per 100,000 per year at the height of the Korean War to 1.2 per 100,000 today. This was a product of um, the spread of democracy, because democracies are less likely to uh, declare war on each other. The spread of peacekeeping forces, which get themselves in between warring parties. The spread of commerce, because countries that trade with each other are less likely to fight wars. You don't kill your customers. Uh, you don't kill your, your, uh, your debtors. And if it's cheaper to buy things than to steal them, then you're less tempted to uh, engage in plunder. And it's also a gift of a, a change in international norms and institutions, where war is no longer uh, legal as a way of settling disputes between uh, countries. Uh, yesterday, I was walking along in this, a street uh, named after Aristide Briand, uh, the architect of the kellogg briand Pact, the Paris Peace Pact, which uh, many people ridicule because in 1928, it outlawed war. And obviously, it was not effective uh, in the first decade after it was uh, implemented. But uh, one could argue that over the long term, it really did have an effect. And whereas in conquest used to be just a regular occurrence between countries, if one country uh, had a dispute with another, and say over an unpaid debt, it could take a chunk of territory, and the global community would uh, recognize that conquest. Today, as we see from the uh, very rare and unusual and condemned uh, uh, annexation of Crimea by Russia, conquest is no longer uh, acceptable, and it is uh, extremely rare. And that may be another cause of the historical decline of war since 1945. Uh, freedom and rights. We have all read with uh, alarm, sometimes horror, at the assault on democracy in countries like Russia, and Venezuela, Turkey, Poland, uh, Brazil, to some extent the United States. Uh, nonetheless, uh, if you count up the total number of countries that are democratic or autocratic and scale them by how democratic or how autocratic they are, you see that the world has never been more democratic than it has been in the last uh, decade. And lest this seem impossible to believe, re recall that in the early 1900s, the number of democracies in the world could be counted on the fingers of one hand. Even in, when I was an uh, undergraduate student in the 1970s, the world had only 31 democracies. Half of Europe was behind the Iron Curtain and lived under uh, totalitarian communist dictatorships. Spain and Portugal were fascist dictatorships. Greece was under the control of the colonels, a, a military junta. Almost all of Latin America was run by uh, military dictatorships. In East Asia, Taiwan, South Korea, Philippines, Indonesia were uh, dictatorships, all of them uh, democratic today. today uh, two-thirds of the world's countries are more democratic than autocratic, and two-thirds of the world's population lives in uh, uh, democratic countries. There are other exercises of government force or brutality that are being, um, uh, being uh, reduced or eliminated. The death penalty has been abolished in country after country after country. Uh, even, and if the current trend continues, 
probably won't uh, extrapolate linearly. But if it did, the world would abolish capital punishment entirely by the year 2026. Capital punishment would go the way of slavery, which was once ubiquitous, but now is illegal everywhere on Earth. Even in the United States, which in this regard, and with many regards, is something of an outlier among Western democracies. The United States still executes people. It's the only Western democracy that does it. But even in the United States, the rate of executions has been going down, down, down. Two weeks ago, Washington became the 20th state to abolish capital punishment. And even Texas and Mississippi, which are the most enthusiastic about executing people, the rate of executions has been going steadily downward. In another trend, uh, victimless crimes like homosexuality are being uh, abolished in country after country. Most recently, just two weeks ago, uh, India uh, became uh, a, uh, one of the countries that abolished capital, um, sorry, the criminalization of homosexuality. Infant, uh, sorry, uh, child labor. Uh, it was standard for most of history to, for children to be sent to work in farms and factories. About 30% of children in England in 1850 uh, were uh, engaged in labor. That was reduced to uh, close to zero by the middle of the 20th century. Because of uh, uh, affluence, parents no longer depended on money that their children brought in. Because of the increased value that we place on education, an educated child is worth, worth more than a child who picks crops in the fields. And because of a general increase in the valuation of the lives of children. And this has been uh, repeated in every uh, uh, rich country, such as Italy. And it's taking place in the world as a whole. In 2015, the Nobel Peace Prize was shared by Kailash Satyarthi for his efforts in reducing rates of child labor. And the uh, black lines uh, on the graph show that uh, his efforts have been having a real effect. Violent crime. In any part of the world that exists in a state of anarchy, you have people uh, preying on each other and then others uh, acting in revenge, sometimes leading to cycles of vendetta and uh, feuding. In medieval Europe, for example, the homicide rate was 35 per 100,000 per year. Then as the first kingdom started to establish control over the feudal patchwork of uh, fiefs. Uh, the rates of violence uh, went down in every European country, and now are, in most countries are one per 100,000 per year. This is a process that tends to repeat itself in any part of the world in which frontier regions are brought under the control of a central government so that the code of vendetta and revenge and feuding is replaced by the rule of law. Happened again in the United States in colonial New England, happened in the American Wild West, and it happened in Mexico. Mexico is famous now for having a very high crime rate, but even the rate that it has now is a one third of what it was a century ago. If we zoom in on the uh, last 60 years or so, we see that in uh, Western countries like the United States, which had a big increase in their crime rate in, starting in the 1960s, have then brought it back down. Uh, the United States has reduced its homicide rate by more than 50%. And the world as a whole has seen about a 30% reduction in homicide just in the last 20 years. Not just homicide, but other violent crimes seem to be in decline in the United States. Domestic violence. Uh, Husbands uh, beating up wives, boyfriends assaulting girlfriends have been in decline, as has uh, rape and sexual assault. If you were to plot the rate of rape in the United States since statistics were first kept in the 1970s, you would see a 75% reduction in the rate of rape. And violence against children, such as bullying and other forms of victimization of children at school, and physical abuse and sexual abuse by caregivers at home. In fact, we've been getting safer in just about every way. Uh, thanks to advances in the safety of automobiles and of highways, you are 96% uh, less likely to die in a car accident. 
88% less likely to be killed as a pedestrian, 99% less likely to die in a plane crash, 59% less likely to fall to your death, 90% less likely to drown, 92% less likely to die in a fire, 92% less likely to be asphyxiated. But there is one exception to this trend of increasing safety, uh, in the, at least in the United States. And that is the category called poison, solid, or liquid. Now, this category includes drug overdoses. And what you're seeing here is the American opioid epidemic, a uh, counterexample to the trend of increasing safety. At the same time, uh, we are 95% less likely to be killed on the job. We're even less likely to die in a so-called act of God. The uh, droughts, floods, uh, forest fires, tsunamis, volcanoes, meteor strikes, earthquakes, uh, presumably not because God is any less angry at us, but because of improvements in the resilience of our infrastructure, in the ability to predict uh, disasters, and in emergency response afterward. And what about the quintessential act of God, the projectile hurled by Zeus, the literal bolt from the blue? Yes, we are 97% less likely to be killed by a bolt of lightning. Knowledge. The natural state of humanity is illiteracy. And uh, for most of human history, uh, only a privileged few could read and write. In uh, 1475, for example, about 15% of Europeans were literate. European countries and the United States achieved universal literacy by the 20th century. And the rest of the world is uh, catching up. Latin American countries like Chile and Mexico uh, and the world as a whole uh, now has a rate of 81% uh, literacy, 90% for people under the age of 25. Not just men, but women. In uh, 1750 in England, only six women could read for, and write for every 10 men who could. But England achieved gender parity in literacy by the end of the uh, 19th century. And the, uh, world as a whole is very, very close to equality in literacy between boys and girls. Even in the uh, most backward parts of the world for girls' education, Pakistan and Afghanistan, the trend is, uh, is upward. For that, we have, uh, in part, uh, have to thank the other winner of the 2015 Nobel Peace Prize, Malala Yousafzai. And in perhaps the most unbelievable incredible, difficult to swallow example of progress of all, we have been getting smarter. This is true. In a phenomenon known as the Flynn effect, IQ scores have increased by three points a decade throughout the 20th century. So today, people score 30 <coughs> points higher on an IQ test than their uh, great grandparents did. This is a result of uh, improvements in public health, in the sp uh, spread of education, and in the proliferation of technical concepts, abstract ideas, visual symbols from specialized domains of uh, technology and science and expertise into everyday life. Well, does any of this uh, improve the quality of our lives? Uh, in many ways, they do. For example, in uh, 150 years ago, the typical work week in Europe and the United States was more than 60 hours. Today, it is fewer than 40 hours. And most people have several weeks of paid vacation. In the United States, it's only three weeks. In uh, France, it is uh, considerably higher, uh, a concept that would have been inconceivable in the 19th century. And because of the universal penetration of running water, electricity, and the widespread adoption of labor-saving devices like washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, stoves, and microwaves, <coughs> the amount of our lives that we waste on housework, which people indicate is their least favorite way of spending their time, has decreased from 60 hours a week to less than 15 hours a week. Because the work week has been getting shorter and because we spend less time on uh, housework, the amount of leisure time has increased in the last 50 years, both for men and for women. 
Now, these data are from the United States. And you'll see that the uh, curve for women has uh, leveled off. And the reason is that women today spend more time with their children. In fact, a single working mother today spends more hours with her children than a married stay-at-home mother did in the 1950s. And we have more of our salary to enjoy on uh, pleasures and luxuries. 100 years ago, 60% of a paycheck went to necessities in life. Now it is less than one third. OK, so those are uh, variables that economists like to measure. Uh, do they make us any happier? And the answer is, on average, they do. Uh, there is a, a very strong relationship between life satisfaction, as people judge it by, for themselves, and uh, income. Uh, it is, I've plotted it here on a logarithmic scale, which means that in reality, the, the, uh, it, the curve bends over. So an extra uh, euro makes a poor person much happier than it makes a rich person happier. But nonetheless, the relationship holds across the scale uh, of income. Each one of these dots is a country. Each one of the arrows shows the correlation uh, within a country. And what the graph shows is that people in rich countries are happier. Uh, within every country, the richer people are happier. So as societies get richer, you would expect their people to get happier. And indeed, in surveys that measure happiness over several decades, 86% of the, the uh, countries have shown a gain in happiness. Uh, here I've just given you three examples, Netherlands, United Kingdom, and uh, France, uh, and uh, which shows there are ups and downs, but overall there is a uh, positive trend. Well, has all of this progress come at the expense of the environment? And the answer is uh, it obviously has, uh, especially in the past. However, once societies reach a, uh, a certain level of affluence, they uh, start to favor the quality of the environment. For a poor country with no electricity, uh, electricity is so valuable that they are willing to live with some air pollution. Uh, but as societies get rich enough so they can afford electricity and clean air, they spring for the clean air in addition. Uh, this is true both because richer societies can afford more uh, cleaner sources of energy, but also because as societies become richer, their values change. People place a higher value on the state of the environment and start to pass legislation and technology that starts to clean the environment up. In fact, in a report card on the state of the environment across the world, 178 out of 180 countries showed an improvement over the last uh, decade. I'll just show you some data for the United States. Since the Environmental Protection Agency was founded in 1970 and the Clean Air Act and other legislation, uh, even though the American population increased by 40%, the GDP increased by 2 and a half, Americans drove twice as many miles per year, but the level of the five major air pollutants declined by 60%. Now, you might uh, think that these, uh, this progress is not sustainable because the world will simply have more and more and more uh, people, and that as the population just keeps exploding, uh, there's no way that there are enough resources to keep up with the growth. But we know that when societies get richer, better educated, more urbanized, and have more empowerment of women, their birth rate falls. Uh, this is obvious in Western Europe, where many countries are declining in population, true also in Japan, China, and it is likely to happen in every country that gets more urban, more affluent, uh, and with greater gender equality. Uh, if you take these factors into account, then the world's population may peak in around 2070 and uh, start to decline. We've already seen uh, several kinds of progress in protecting the environment, such as cutting down forests. At least in the temperate world, in the northern hemisphere, the rate of deforestation has gone to zero as uh, when farming becomes more efficient and needs less land, farmland is abandoned and it's reclaimed by forests. Uh, in the tropical world, 
the uh, deforestation continues, but it has peaked and it has started to come down. Uh, now, uh, this is maybe threatened by the election of uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil. And in fact, many of the trends that I have spoken about this afternoon are uh, threatened by the rise of authoritarian populists. But uh, we know that progress uh, can be possible and we can work toward uh, continuing it. Uh, in uh, the oceans, the amount of oil shipped by sea has drastically increased, but the number of oil spills has declined because of improvements in the technology of oil tankers. And the proportion of the Earth's surface that is protected against economic exploitation in protected areas has more than doubled, about 15% of uh, land and about 12% uh, of the oceans. Well, uh, I hope to have convinced you that progress is not a matter of having a good attitude or a, uh, a positive disposition or being optimistic. It is a fact. It is a fact about human history, perhaps the most important fact about human history. And how is this fact uh, reflected in the news media? Well, in an analysis of, uh, of the, using the technique of sentiment mapping, which tabulates the proportion of positive and negative words in uh, online news stories, uh, has found that in all of these decades in which life has been getting longer, healthier, richer, safer, uh, happier, the New York Times has gotten increasingly uh, morose, and a summary of the world's broadcasts has also gotten glummer and glummer. It's true not just in the news media, but it's true in people's attitudes about the state of the world. Uh, this graph shows the percentage of people uh, who, um, when asked the question, do you, all things considered, do you think that the world is getting uh, better, worse, or neither? Uh, in a country like China, about 40% of people think the world is getting better. In a country like France, 3% of the uh, people think the world is getting better. So while uh, citizens of France consider themselves happy, they consider everyone else unhappy. And that is true, actually, in uh, um, virtually every country. So why are people uh, unaware of progress? Why do they deny it? Part of the answer comes from a combination of our cognitive psychology and the nature of journalism. Uh, many cognitive psychologists uh, believe that the uh, human mind tends to estimate risk and probability using a mental uh, trick called the availability heuristic, a term coined by Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman. Namely, the more easily we can remember examples of something, the more common we think it is in the world. So we use our own uh, brain's search engine as a way of estimating probability. For example, if people read about a, uh, a shark attack, then they think that uh, swimming in the ocean is dangerous. People uh, judge tornadoes, uh, at least in the United States, to kill more people every year than uh, asthma attacks, even though asthma attacks kill 80 times as many people as tornadoes. But uh, tornadoes make for very good television. Asthma attacks, not so much. Well, now consider more generally the nature of news. Uh, news is about things that happen, not things that don't happen. You never see a journalist saying, I'm reporting live from a country that is at peace, or a city that has not been attacked by terrorists. Uh, no matter how rare negative events like wars may be, as long as they don't go to zero, there will always be examples to fill the news. And people's judgments about the uh, dangers of war will be disconnected from the actual uh, state of affairs. Also, news is about events, things that happen quickly, not things that happen gradually. And bad things can happen quickly. A war can break out. There can be a, a, a stock market crash. A building can collapse. There can be a terrorist attack. Or, uh, but good things aren't built in a day, and they can creep up. Uh, Max Roser, an economist at the University of Oxford, points out that the news could have carried the headline, 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, every day for the last 30 years. 
But they never ran that headline with the result that a billion and a quarter people escaped from extreme poverty and no one knows about it. Also, there is a, uh, a well-documented negativity bias in uh, journalism. If you give editors the same story described in positive terms or negative terms, they'll describe it in negative terms. If you give them a choice between something getting better and getting worse, they'll pick the one getting worse, uh, which is, uh, lies behind a uh, humorous uh, headline from the satirical American newspaper, The Onion. CNN holds morning meeting to decide what viewers should panic about for the rest of the day. Well, if you combine the uh, availability heuristic with the nature of news, you can see why the world uh, has been coming to an end for a very long time indeed. Uh, a second reason rooted in our psychology is, has been called the negativity bias, the fact that in general, uh, bad is stronger than good, psychologically speaking. There are more words for negative emotions than for positive emotions. People can think of many more things that could uh, make their lives worse on a given day than things that can make their lives better. You can try it. Uh, the, we dread losses more than we enjoy uh, gains. And we uh, pay attention to have a better memory for negative events than positive ones, at least for recent negative events. With the passage of time, the negative aspect of our memories tends to fade, making us wired for nostalgia. As uh, Franklin Pierce Adams pointed out, nothing is more responsible for the good old days than a bad memory. There's also market forces in, uh, uh, in, uh, among profits uh, that uh, if you're predicting the future, pessimism sounds serious. A pessimist sounds like he's trying to help you. Optimism sounds frivolous. An optimist sounds like he's trying to sell you something. And also, there is competition for influence, for prestige, for uh, moral esteem among society's uh, elites, the uh, intellectuals, the journalists, the business people, the technologists, the military, the uh, uh, religious, and to Complain about modern society is a way of, um, uh, of disparaging your professional rivals. It's a way that intellectuals can look down on business people. Business people can look down on politicians. Uh, politicians who are challengers can uh, attack politicians currently in office, and so on. As Thomas Hobbes said uh, 350 years ago, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence of antiquity for men compete with the living, not with the dead. Let me end with three questions about progress and enlightenment that I suspect have occurred to many of you. Uh, first, isn't it good to be pessimistic, you might think, to speak truth to power, to rake the muck, to uh, uh, safeguard against complacency? Well, not exactly. I think it's important to be accurate. Of course, journalism must cover uh, the dangers, the risks, the injustice, the suffering, wherever it occurs. But it's also important to cover uh, what works, what can combat it. Because just as there may be dangers in complacency, there are also dangers in indiscriminate uh, pessimism. One of them is fatalism. If you think that the world is just getting worse and worse and worse, no matter what people do, all of the efforts that people have made to make the world a better place have all failed, uh, natural response is, well, why even bother? Why uh, waste time and money on a hopeless cause? We should just enjoy ourselves while we can. And if you think that we're doomed, that if climate change doesn't kill us, then runaway robots and artificial intelligence will, well, the natural response is there's nothing we can do about it. Let's uh, have fun now. It's our grandchildren's problem. The other danger is radicalism. If you think that all of our institutions are failing and beyond any hope of reform, then a natural response is to smash the machine, drain the swamp, uh, burn the empire to the ground on the expectation that anything that rises out of the ashes is bound to be better than what we have uh, today. Or as we heard in the United States two years ago, only I can fix it. Uh, is progress inevitable? And the answer is, of course not. <laughs> 
progress does not mean that everything gets better for everyone, everywhere, all the time. That wouldn't be progress. That would be a miracle. And progress is not a miracle. Progress consists of using knowledge to solve problems. Problems are inevitable, and solutions create new problems which must be solved in their turn. Also, even against the backdrop of continuous gradual progress, there can always be nasty surprises, and I've mentioned a number of them in this uh, lecture. The world wars, the uh, crime explosion in the 1960s, AIDS in Africa, and the American opioid epidemic. And there are currently uh, great challenges that the world has not solved. The most prominent among them are the threat of uh, dangerous climate change and the threat of nuclear war. I argue in the book that we should treat these as problems that are not yet solved, but that are solvable, rather than as an ap apocalypses in waiting. And that we should aggressively pursue decarbonization of the world economy through a combination of uh, policy, such as carbon taxes, I know very much in the news in uh, France uh, this week, um, and uh, technologies for low carbon, zero carbon, and eventually negative carbon uh, uh, energy. And again, uh, France is in the forefront with its build out of nuclear power, which is the world's most abundant and scalable form of zero carbon energy. To deal with the risk of nuclear war, we should increase the security of um, international uh, relations to prevent the possibility of uh, accidental or hasty use of nuclear weapons. And we should work toward the reduction of nuclear weapons, eventually culminating in the total elimination of uh, weapons uh, worldwide. Now, that might seem like it's a, something out of the the, the, the beatniks and the hippies of the 1960s, out of Peter, Paul, and Mary. Uh, but actually, this is a solution that has been embraced by some of the most realistic hawks of the Cold War, including Henry Kissinger, uh, William Perry, George Shultz, Sam Nunn, and before them, of Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev. Uh, some evidence that we can make progress at dealing with these challenges, even though we have not solved them, comes from the fact that the amount of CO2 that is emitted per unit of wealth, dollar of GDP, follows a natural arc of increase and decrease. With the Industrial Revolution, massive amounts of coal were burned and CO2 went uh, way up. Then with the shift to lower carbon sources of energy, to oil, to gas, to hydro, to nuclear, to renewables, uh, developed countries were able to produce more and more wealth uh, per amount of CO2 emitted. Uh, this happened in uh, China. The amount of CO2 went through the roof during the uh, regime of Mao Zedong, who forced peasants to set up smelters in their backyard. They had to melt down their, their, their woks, their doorknobs, their knives to produce useless steel, so there was massive carbon emissions with zero economic output. But then Mao died, China came to its senses, and uh, its amount of carbon per uh, unit of GDP has come down. Uh, India has uh, turned a corner, and here you have a, the graph for the world as, as a whole. Now, this does not mean that the world is on track to solving the problem of climate change for two reasons. One of them is that even though the world produces more wealth per CO2 uh, emitted, it's producing more and more wealth. And it's not enough that these numbers decline. They have to go to zero. But the graph shows that it is, there is nothing that inherently ties the creation of wealth to flaming carbon. Uh, and as far as nuclear weapons are concerned, few people realize that the world's nuclear stockpile has been reduced by 85% since the uh, Cold War. Like, again, many of the developments I've spoken about, this is threatened by uh, the rise of authoritarian populists like uh, Donald Trump, who uh, pro has proposed to scrap the intermediate range uh, missile treaty. Uh, all the more reason that we should pressure our politicians to continue this process 
uh, and not see it as something that is unrealistic or impossible, and prioritize nuclear arms reduction uh, as, a, um, uh, 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 as a policy. My final question, does the Enlightenment just go against human nature? And this is a sharp question for me, because I have written several books arguing that there is such a thing as human nature, which changes very slowly uh, or not at all. And some critics of the Enlightenment and humanism say that it's just too arid, too tepid, too flattened to get people's hearts pounding. Uh, is the, uh, at the struggle to reduce sickness, famine, poverty, violence, and ignorance just boring? Uh, do people need to believe in, a, uh, in miracles, in a father in the sky, in a strong chief to protect the tribe, in myths of heroic ancestors? Well, I don't think so. For one thing, we know that secular liberal democracies are the happiest and healthiest places on Earth, uh, probably in the history of our species, and they are the top destination for people who, as we say, vote with their feet. Also, I would argue that using knowledge and sympathy to enhance human flourishing is heroic, glorious, uh, perhaps even spiritual. Uh, it is not just another myth. Uh, myths are fictions, and this one is true. True to the best of our knowledge, which is the only truth we can have. And it is a story that belongs not just to one tribe, but to all of humanity, to any sentient creature with the power of reason and the urge to persist in its being. For it depends on nothing more than the uh, conviction that um, la vie est préférable à, à la mort, la santé est préférable à la maladie, l'abondance est préférable aux besoins, la liberté est préférable à la coercition, la paix est préférable à la guerre, le bonheur est préférable à la souffrance, et la connaissance est préférable à la superstition et à l'ignorance. Merci. Thank you. Um, so you started out by um, saying that you believe that the ideals of the Enlightenment needed to be defended with as much fervor as some of the other ideologies that you alluded to, and you regretted that that wasn't the fact. Do you think, so many people here are you know, academics and intellectuals, do you think that we have a particular responsibility in better defending those ideals, and if so, how? Yes, I, I, uh, I, I do think we have a responsibility to defend our deal, uh, those ideals. They're the ideals that make our own lives meaningful. Uh, and uh, they're ideals we, we believe in. And that uh, I, I think I speak for, for uh, many people in uh, saying that they, that they hold the promise of uh, improving the well-being of humanity, of science and, uh, and humanism and reason. Um, how it... it um, uh, it depends on the audience. Uh, my own effort is to reach people who read books, people who, uh, not just academics and journalists and politicians, but just people who are interested in ideas, who may be unaware of the fact that there has been progress, as, and indeed, as most people are. So surveys that ask people, do you think that extreme poverty has increased, decreased, or stayed the same? A majority of people say, stay the same or decreased. And they're just wrong. So likewise, people are unaware that the life expectancy worldwide has risen to 71 years. So just getting the word out that progress has happened, um, that um, science can be and has been a force uh, for human advancement. It has eliminated diseases like smallpox. Uh, it has the promise of, uh, of uh, uh, treating diseases like Alzheimer's and uh, uh, Parkinson's and, and uh, cancer. Uh, and that, uh, like it or not, we are all committed to reason. As soon as we make any argument, uh, we are already using, uh, using reason. Uh, so, uh, and there are sectors of academia and intellectual life that are not so sure about Enlightenment values. Uh, certainly in many universities and, and uh, uh, not just in France, but in the United States, there are um, philosophies of postmodernism, of relativism, of hostility to science, 
uh, where the idea of reason is, um, is, is scorned. The uh, science is considered to give us just pollution and, uh, and gas chambers and, and uh, atom bombs. Uh, that there's no such thing as the truth. Everyone has their own truth, every race, every gender, every culture. Uh, so it might begin within um, intellectual life uh, itself. Uh, and then uh, one, one thinks that the people who write for a living, who uh, speak for a living, one hopes has an influence that spreads out to, to uh, other people and that the culture as a whole, by processes that I are still mysterious, there are cultural changes that no one can dictate, if, uh, but, that, but that can happen uh, gradually. And, and we know that there have been changes in sensibilities, such as the fact that, um, say, uh, there's been a revolution in gay rights in the last couple of decades, where support for keeping homosexuality illegal has plummeted. Uh, support for racial segregation has gone to, to uh, 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 way down. Uh, we don't know exactly how these processes happen, but there is, uh, but, but uh, certainly articulating them and arguing for them is at least a start. I was wondering what you thought about people who think that the biggest threat today actually comes from the rise of AI, of artificial intelligence, and- uh, Sorry, uh, out of the- out of the rise of artificial, oh, artificial intelligence, intelligence yes. and uh, pandemics, and then most that most graduates should really be working on these two topics. Yeah, um, I, I have a discussion of artificial intelligence in Enlightenment now. There, there will certainly be disruptions as uh, more occupations are uh, replaced by artificial intelligence. Overall, this should be a tremendous uh, bonanza, tre tremendous advance in human well-being. Because no one really enjoys mining coal or driving trucks or picking fruit or making beds. If we can have robots doing all these things, then uh, that could lead to enormous uh, liberation of humans to do things that they enjoy much more. Uh, now, we don't have an economic system now that can take the huge gain, potential gains in productivity from automation and uh, allow them to be widely shared. But there are proposals like a universal basic income or a negative income tax um, that would uh, allow the huge average benefit to be enjoyed uh, across the population. And if we're smart enough to develop a robot that can drive or a robot that can make beds, I think we're also smart enough to develop policies that could share the gains in wealth uh, across the population. The, uh, it will be a challenge. The, um, I, I think the fear that you're raising is one that is, that is occasionally brought up, or actually more and more brought up, that the uh, artificial intelligence will either subjugate us, enslave us, do to us what we did to animals. You know, we're smarter than animals, and so when AI is smarter than us, uh, it will keep us on farms, it will keep us as pets. Um, uh, I, I think that that's a, a misunderstanding of what intelligence is, that uh, it confuses human nature, which has a combination of intelligence and um, a tendency to exploit, a tendency to dominate, a tendency to harm, and kind of assumes that they're the same thing. But they're actually two different, the motive to dominate and the ability to think. The reason just happened to be packaged together in humans because we're products of evolution. But if we invent uh, artificial intelligence, there's no reason that it should have any urge to dominate. Uh, as the, uh, the, the other existential threat that uh, people raise for artificial intelligence, which I also think is, is uh, fanciful, is that um, it will destroy us uh, as, as collateral damage, as, as a byproduct. So we give it the, uh, an artificial intelligence the goal of making paper clips, and it, it just uses every last atom to make paper clips, including our bodies. Or we give artificial intelligence the goal, cure cancer, and it drafts us as uh, guinea pigs for fatal experiments. Now, I, I think a lot of clever people try to think up ways in which this could happen, none of which make any sense to me. Because it, they involve the contradiction, the inherent contradiction, that a system would be intelligent, intelligent enough to cure cancer but stupid enough not to realize that's not what we mean by curing cancer uh, or making paper clips. And it also assumes that 
we humans would be smart enough to develop an artificial system that could, uh, say, cure cancer, but we'd be so stupid that we wouldn't make sure that we specified what we wanted it to do in more detail. Uh, so, uh, and trading off conflicting goals is not some like, add-on that engineers might forget to include in intelligence. It is intelligence. Everything we do involves trading off many different criteria. And the idea that something we would call intelligent would pursue one thing and neglect everything else just contradicts the definition of intelligence. So anyway, that, uh, not everyone shares this uh, view. I do think there are things we should be concerned about for artificial intelligence. Being turned into paper clips is not one of them. Uh, yes. I, I wanted to ask to the extent that uh, okay, I take the view, I don't know how much it's borne by the evidence, but to the extent that reason is part of our uh, universal genetic endowment, like uh, intuitive physics and language, um, it's uh, very curious how little research is spent on uh, why most people in the world still believe in magical thinking, why religions are, and superstitions are still so prevalent, and uh, <laughs> if you think you're dealing with a pessimist, how progress could perhaps be much greater if research into the obstacles to this in education, in, in politics, since uh, just one thing about your anecdote about your childhood in Bakunin, which is no anarchist ever said there shouldn't be militias protecting people from harm. The, the, in the, many ways, the world is still founded on unreason and so uh, it's curious that more research is not done into how that uh, endowment is developed and what the obstacles are and how it can be more fostered, which seems uh, close to climate change and the threat of nuclear war in terms of importance of research aims. Yes. No, I, I agree. But there, there, there is within cognitive science a, a reasonable amount of research in things like essentialism, the um, belief, the intuitive belief that we might be born with, that uh, things have an, an essence that determines their, uh, their function and which could lead to, which leads to many folk biological beliefs that modern biology refutes, uh, some of which we call magical thinking. Um, and uh, there are uh, people in, in this room or affiliated with this institute who have studied uh, in natural reasoning and how it can be refined, including uh, Dan Sperber, uh, Hugo Mercier, Nicolas Beaumard. Um, and, uh, but I agree that, we, that we, we need more of it, that it is a, a, a crucial topic. And why now, in an age of uh, unparalleled uh, formal reason in science, in logic, in mathematics, the unparalleled availability of information in Wikipedia, in online books, in, uh, we should also have a, uh, a rise in superstitious thinking, conspiracy theories, anti-vaccine crusades, uh, and so on. I think much of the answer, though, will have not much to do with human reasoning, but rather with human tribal affiliation. And studies of, say, denial of human-made climate change or denial of evolution show that, in fact, it's not a matter of uh, scientific ignorance. It's not a matter of errors in uh, reasoning. That people who believe in, hum in man-made climate change are no better in tests of science than people who deny it. Uh, so for example, many people who believe that humans have been uh, affecting the climate believe that it's because of the release of uh, hydrogen gas, or it's because of the ozone hole, and that we should deal with it by cleaning up toxic waste dumps. They have a general sense of green versus pollution, and their intuitive model of climate change is just part of their, their philosophy of green uh, thinking. Uh, conversely, many of the people who deny man-made climate change have, uh, are real experts, and they are like expert lawyers or litigators who know every point and then can figure out some way of refuting it. And uh, if you get into a debate with them, uh, even if you are on the side of the majority of scientists, uh, you, might, you might lose. Uh, the, what Daniel Kahan, a uh, Yale uh, legal scholar, has shown is that what predicts people's opinions on politically charged issues like climate change is not failures of reasoning, failures of knowledge. It's simply affiliation with political ideology. The farther you are to the left, the more you accept climate change. The farther you are to the right, the more you deny climate change. Uh, 
Same with evolution. So it's, it is indeed a pathology of reasoning, but it's not because of failures of uh, logic, failures of knowledge. It's because our tribal affiliations, including political tribes, left wing and right wing, uh, dominate our, um, uh, our beliefs. And there's even a perverse logic to it. It de depends on what the uh, goal of your reasoning system is. Uh, for most people, the goal of the reasoning system is not necessarily to arrive at, the, at objective truth. Uh, it's to um, enhance their or to protect their status within their, uh, within their group, within their tribe. Um, as uh, Sperber and Mercier uh, put it, a lot of reasoning is deployed to win arguments, not to uh, attain the truth. And so if you're in a community of people, of right-wing people, it would be highly irrational for you to say that you believe in human-made climate change because you would be a pariah, you'd be a weirdo, you'd be a, a traitor. Conversely, if you're in a group of left-wing thinkers, um, you, it doesn't matter how you got to the conclusion, but you had better say that you believe in human-made climate, climate change or you'll be a villain. So there's a perverse uh, local rationality of the goal of be being a good member of a uh, tribe which overrides what is best for humanity as a whole, namely that we collectively align our beliefs with what is true. Kahan calls it the, or I, I renamed it, the tragedy of the belief commons, uh, an analogy with the tragedy of the commons, where it pays every townsperson to graze his livestock on the town commons, even if it denudes the commons and is worse for everyone. So it may pay everyone to hold the belief that their friends and their neighbors believe, even though collectively <coughs> we're much worse off than if our beliefs are uh, aligned with, with objective truth. So the challenge there is not so much how to educate people to um, think better, but um, rather how to decouple people's objective beliefs from their tribal affiliation and how to make our uh, collective beliefs um, as close as possible to uh, objective truth as we can at attain it. But it, the more general point that we need more research on this, I completely agree. Oui, euh, je vais sortir d'ici euh, très heureux de, de l'image que vous donnez, de progrès euh, et de, du fait que le monde qu'on va laisser à nos enfants sera sans doute beaucoup meilleur que celui que nous avons connu. Mais euh, il me semble quand même que certains points qui ne sont pas du progrès auraient mérité peut-être un peu plus d'attention. Je vais en donner deux pour ne pas être trop long. Vous avez parlé, par exemple, de, des armes nucléaires et de la diminution des armes nucléaires. Peut-être aurait-il été intéressant de parler du nombre d'armes de poing, des, des armes individuelles, aux États-Unis et de leur évolution dans les 20 ou 30 dernières années. Vous avez aussi parlé de... Euh, et là, c'était des courbes impressionnantes. Mais vous avez parlé de, des émissions de carbone par dollar de PIB qui sont allés en diminuant. Mais est-ce que c'est très significatif Parce que si le PIB a augmenté sur une certaine période, de, a été multiplié par 100, et si les émissions de carbone euh, ont... Elles, ou plutôt, les émissions de carbone... Voilà, si le PIB a, a beaucoup, beaucoup augmenté, regardez les émissions par dollars de PIB, mm -hmm. ça n'est pas très significatif. Yes. So the, 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 um, the two parts. The, the first, absolutely, the spread of uh, weapons in the United States is, is not an example of progress. And, and there are many uh, other things that go wrong that are uh, uh, regrettable or deplorable uh, or negative. Uh, and indeed, um, it could not possibly be true that because progress on the whole takes place, uh, everything gets better everywhere. And that would certainly be an example. The United States, in many measures, is a uh, 
uh, kind of an outlier for many of these Enlightenment themes. The United States has more private weapons, has a higher rate of murder, has a lower educational standards, uh, uh, has capital punishment, uh, and, and, and many other ways in which the United States is not at the forefront of, of Enlightenment. And certainly the spread of private weapons would be an example. And you're certainly right that, and, and I, I, I said this, although I may have said it too quickly, it is absolutely true that the uh, fact that the amount of CO2 per unit of wealth produced has de declined does not mean that the amount of CO2 has declined because wealth is increasing faster than, uh, well, in, in most years, faster than the reduction in carbon intensity, that is CO2 per unit of, of dollar. It actually did flatten out for a few years, and now it's in, starting to increase again. But what this, that curve shows is that it is the, there is not a fixed ratio of carbon dioxide emitted per amount of wealth generated, that it is possible through technology through substitution of one fuel for another to bring it down. And so economic growth is not necessarily incompatible with reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But as you note, as long as we still produce wealth, which we obviously must do, uh, that has to go down to zero. Uh, even if it stays uh, at a lower level, that will not be enough. In fact, it ultimately has to be negative because if the CO2 that we've already put in the atmosphere stays there, temperatures could continue to rise because of the greenhouse effect. Uh, and so we'll eventually have to figure out how to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, so again, I agree, this is absolutely a challenge. We have not solved it. There are technologies on the drawing board that could solve it, but it's still a lot of work to uh, uh, to realize those technologies, to adopt them, and to couple them with the, with the right policies. Merci beaucoup pour la conférence, que je trouve était très intéressante. Moi, je, je viens de, de la philo, donc euh, j'étudie les, les auteurs postmodernes que vous avez cités. Euh, pour moi, c'est très éclairant, et je pense aussi, comme vous, qu'il faudrait une collaboration plus étroite entre, entre la philosophie et les sciences. Mais euh, ce qui m'a assez choqué dans votre, dans votre conférence, c'est que euh, vous avez euh, montré qu'on devrait se réjouir euh, de, de la montée du taux de bonheur comme euh, de la diminution du taux des COD. Euh, ce qui la me pose... Diminution du... La diminution du, de la, du taux des COD. Oh. Si, pardon, CO2. Oh, oui. CO2, yes, tu, yes. CO2. Ah, yeah. euh, mais euh, ce qui me... Je me demande comment vous avez pu euh, avoir les données sur le bonheur, parce que euh, euh, si on doit compter les meurtres, c est, c est, pour moi, c'est évident. Mais euh, peut-être pour un philosophe, euh, le bonheur, c'est déjà un concept très problématique. Et euh, j'ai l'impression que, enfin, dans votre étude, on aurait pu collecter les, les données sur le bonheur sur Facebook, par exemple, parce qu'on peut voir des photos où les gens sourient plus ou moins et dire bah, « ça, c'est une personne heureuse ». Euh, parce que si je demande à quelqu'un si, 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 si yeah. cette personne est heureuse, elle peut me dire « oui, par, parfois, de temps en temps, euh, en ce moment, non, mais d'habitude, oui enfin, ». Je, je, je me demande comment vous pouvez object, euh, rendre objectif cette, cette donnée comme, comme les nombres de meurtres aussi. Yeah. Enfin, vous l'avez montré dans la même euh, euh, séquentialité, en fait. Yes, there, there is a, um, a literature, the intersection between uh, psychology and economics on measuring happiness. The most obvious way to measure happiness is you take a person and you say, how happy are you? Now that sounds uh, really stupid, uh, but on the other hand, who could be a better judge than the person himself or herself? You might say, well, people, what do they mean by happy and do they give you a truthful answer? And the uh, the people who try to validate these uh, data uh, try to look for other measures of, of happiness that would uh, show whether that kind of simple response should be believed or not. And in general, almost uh, the consensus is that it's, not, it's a pretty good measure of happiness, just asking people, because it correlates with things like uh, if you ask other people, uh, how happy is he? their judgments tend to correlate with the person's own judgment. If you look at whether they are likely to see a, a psychiatrist or clinical psychologist for depression, 
then they uh, go in opposite directions. Um, if you take measures of uh, brain activity, for example, what parts of the brain are more active when you see a picture of a very cute baby? Those same parts of the brain are more active in people who say they are happy than uh, they're unhappy. Uh, and a number of other measures where you try to triangulate to validate that measure. There is sometimes a difference between asking people, are you happy, and asking people uh, a slightly different question. Imagine a, a ladder where the lowest rung is the worst possible life you could imagine, and the highest rung is the best possible life you could imagine. Where are you on that ladder? Now, that's slightly different from happy, happiness because, uh, for example, uh, how happy you are depends on whether you ask the question on a Monday or a Friday, uh, or whether it's sunny or cloudy outside. And that obviously should not reflect people's assessment of their, uh, the state of their lives. But they do tend to be highly correlated. And uh, even though there are many studies that try to distinguish subjective well-being from happiness, they're so highly correlated that many studies just average them. But you're right that they, but they could be dissociated. And there are other measures of well-being, such as do you live a meaningful life, which again is correlated with do you, are you happy, but not perfectly. So it's possible to do things that make your life more meaningful, but less happy, or vice versa. The, uh, the data that I presented were more on satisfaction, life satisfaction than happiness. So there are questions like, uh, are you living the best possible life you could imagine or the worst possible life you could imagine? And it's not to deny that there are problems in these scales, but I think on the whole they are pretty close to what, what most people would think of as, uh, as happiness or uh, bonheur. First of all, um how accessible are these, uh, the databases for these statistics if somebody wanted to test them for s different kinds of correlations? And uh, I have a, a more specific uh, example of that. So what you call progress is, I guess, quite different from survival of the fittest. Oh, yes. But if you have a mixture of populations growing exponentially with different exponents, there's this uh, Fisher theorem, a fundamental theorem of evolution, I, I think, uh, which says that the uh, rate of increase of fitness is related to the variance of the space of exponents. Uh, so, I so there might be ways to explain things like increasing longevity, decreasing poverty by uh, something other than, you know, uh, I guess the n type of progress that you're talking about. Whereas things like violence, uh, it seems less likely, but uh, I don't know. And uh, yeah, just another little comment on the AI paperclip analogy. I don't know, I have the feeling that that's intended more as a, a, an a, attempt to give an example of an unknown unknown, uh, which of course it's impossible to give. But so criticizing the specifics of it isn't, isn't that fair in a way. But uh, I agree with you generally about what you're saying about AI. But I think that the example is often criticized in an unfair way because it's, it's trying to give you an example of something you wouldn't expect. So when, once it's made specific, it's easy to uh, Yeah, to so, three apart, you know. so the, the data that I cite are all publicly available because I got them, uh, and I didn't gather any of them. Uh, I'm not a demographer. I'm not an economist. Uh, I don't measure GDP. I don't measure <laughs> CO2. So yes, they're all, if you follow the uh, end notes in the book, uh, or go to sites like, um, there are now increasingly sites that aggregate data and make them available. Uh, the one that I use the most is called ourworldindata.org. Max Roser at Oxford is the proprietor. And an amazing number of data sets are available. You can plot them. You can download the data as uh, in Excel spreadsheets and, uh, and indeed test your own hypotheses. Others I got from other sources, World Bank, now has a uh, set of um, downloadable data. Uh, most United Nations organizations have put, put their data online. And it's a general trend in uh, all organizations that keep data to make it, make it available. So that, that part is easy. Um, the, I'm not sure about uh, the relationship between progress and um, uh, evolutionary dynamics, such as uh, the Fisher's fundamental theorem, because the criterion that natural selection maximizes, namely 
uh, number of surviving offspring, or more accurately, number of copies of genes in the next generation, uh, is very different from human uh, from from uh, the, the humanistic values, namely people being happier, healthier, uh, live better educated, uh, more pleasant lives. Indeed, sometimes they can be at cross purposes, and what evolution favors is not what makes people uh, better off. We have to be aware of what evolution favors, but it's not the same as human well-being. Because one way to be evolutionary, evolutionary successful is to exploit other people. Uh, and uh, that, that's not something that we want to, to maximize. Not sure if that was what your question was getting at, but. I'm saying that the, some of the statistics you give in defense of progress, your thesis of progress, might be explainable by something more like survival of the fittest. Don't, Things like don't. longevity or po poverty. It might be uh, the poverty rate decreases if poor people die. Uh, just to put oh, it uh, no, okay. too well, so that, but uh, Yeah, so that, by the way, I, um, so yeah, if all the poor people died and all the rich people lived, uh, which is very unlikely because poor people tend to uh, have more uh, offspring than, than, than rich people. But in any case, that is not true. And I have a graph in the book that shows how it's not true. If instead of plotting percentage of people living in extreme poverty, you plot the number of people living in extreme poverty and the number of people not living in extreme poverty, uh, then you see that the uh, number of people not living in extreme poverty has uh, has increased, the number of people living in extreme poverty uh, has, uh, has decreased. So both by proportion and by number, there has been uh, progress. Uh, of course, any one of the trends, one can test various hypotheses, but it'd be very hard to, especially when plausible causal antecedents can be identified, then um, it's un to take an example, we have vaccination, we have sanitation, and people live longer. Uh, we have doctors washing their hands, and so fewer mothers die of infection after giving birth. Uh, there, it seems pretty clear that attempts to uh, enhance human progress have, have yielded some degree of success. Uh, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, it's true that the paperclip example is meant to be hypothetical. The problem is none of the other hypothetical examples are any more plausible, because they, uh, again, all deal with uh, collateral effects that, by definition, intelligence would, uh, would anticipate. That's what, intelligence, uh, uh, that's what intelligence means. And so others that you know, may be less outlandish, like you give a artificial intelligence the goal of maintaining the water level behind a dam, and so it floods a village because you only told it, keep the water level constant. You didn't tell it, oh, by the way, don't kill people. Uh, again, it, subject to the same uh, uh, the same criticism that this is almost a contradiction in terms to call that an intelligent system. Um, thanks for your conference. I have a question on Rousseau. If I'm not wrong, in your book, on one page, Rousseau, you count Rousseau as an Enlightenment thinker. And of course, if you think about the will to escape the tradition, Rousseau is an Enlightenment thinker. And at another place in the book, you count Rousseau as a romantic, as against progress. So my question is, where do you put Rousseau? Yes. <laughs> and this question is important because of the importance of Rousseau in France, French political thought, and also uh, because I wonder if uh, there, there is not a difference between the English Enlightenment and the French one. Uh, the, I wonder if the idea of progress is certainly linked, is not certainly linked to Adam Smith, to Mill and the utilitarians. But if you accept Condorcet, I think that in France, people were less interested by progress than by designing a perfect, absolute state of perfection 
uh, a political state of perfect. And they were more interested by the installation of this perfect political state than the progress of human condition. Yeah. What, would you agree with that? Yeah, uh, I would. And the, of course, there's no correct answer as to whether Rousseau was part of the Enlightenment or the counter-Enlightenment romantic movement, because the Enlightenment wasn't a, a club. It, wasn't, uh, it didn't have an official beginning and ending like the, the Olympics uh, with ceremonies. And so, um, so I don't think that, that question itself can be answered. But what one can uh, ask is, of the clusters of ideas that all of the Enlightenment thinkers uh, around that era proposed, uh, does Rousseau stand uh, apart from uh, many of the other ideas? And uh, my reading and, and my sense from many intellectual historians is that Rousseau, of course, he was during the Enlightenment, but that his ideas were, were different from uh, many of the other thinkers, and that he was kind of a, something of, a, of an outlier or a, a different style of, of thinker. For, uh, for a number of the reasons that you uh, elucidated, namely he did, um, he did look back more than, than forward. He thought of a, uh, that, that we lived in a state of, of primeval uh, harmony, that he did believe in a kind of perfection and a kind of um, group um, spirit or, or, or um, a mind separate from the individuals that, that make it up, that uh, his ideas, maybe he should not be blamed, but there were ideas that were influenced by him that did see imposition of a perfect state as the goal, as opposed to the state being a means to the end of increasing happiness of individuals. Um, so I would, uh, I, I, so I recognize the question, and, and uh, if I were to say, oh, he doesn't count as the Enlightenment thinker, then you could accuse me of saying, well, you know, aren't you jiggering, gerrymandering the concept of Enlightenment? Um, so I wouldn't answer it that way. Uh, instead, I would simply say that his ideas are very different from the tradition of Locke and Montesquieu and uh, Adam Smith and the American uh, Enlightenment thinkers like Hamilton, Jefferson, uh, Madison. Now, uh, there, are, there are sometimes distinctions are made between the French Enlightenment, the Scottish Enlightenment, German Enlightenment, American Enlightenment, but I've never seen like com completely coherent uh, national enlightenments that really differ from one each other, because they, they, they talk to each other, they traveled back and forth, they published uh, works that were very quickly translated. Um, so I'm not sure that it's coherent to talk about the English or French Enlightenment, though it may be coherent to talk about Rousseau versus other Enlightenment thinkers. Yeah, I'm sure that you would add many other uh, reasons to suggest beyond the, as you call it, the tragedy of the belief commons, why uh, reason and promotion of knowledge are not top on the list of our policymakers. But perhaps there's a paradox. I was just wondering, uh, thinking about the definition of optimism that David Deutsch uh, has in his book, uh, Beginning of Infinity, which I believe was an inspiration, you cite as an inspiration for yourself, namely that failures are due to lack of knowledge. That is a, an expression, another way to express confidence that knowledge and reason and science will uh, help to solve the int seemingly intractable problems. So I, was just, I sort of came up with a, the opposite of that, that is the doctrine of pessimism. You might state as success promotes ignorance. That it, oh, success promotes ignorance? Right. That is, we, in other words, complacency, uh, especially the people who are making uh, policy decisions. That's just sort of the opposite of every element of uh, Deutsch's uh, definition of optimism. Uh, yeah. So in that complacent state, perhaps promoting progress, therefore we might promote more complacency. Uh, if I'm feeling great about driving around my SUV and everything's going fine for me and I'm getting elected to the Senate, uh, then why should I bother about learning about ways to change things? And so maybe um, the promotion of progress might backfire in a certain <laughs> sense that we want to promote more uh, expression of the big problems in the world. Well, it, uh, it, it, um, I, I wouldn't put it that way, no. That uh, our, our assessment of whether the world is getting better or worse should be determined by whether the world is getting better or worse, uh, measure by measure because not everything gets better uh, at the same time. Again, that's, there's no miraculous process that makes everything better. There couldn't possibly be. Uh, and that the, uh, 
the question of complacency versus um, uh, effort depends on our confidence that knowledge that we could acquire, technologies that we could apply, have the reasonable expectation of changing the world in a way that we, that we want. And so if we thought that uh, despite enormous efforts to make things better, things just get worse because they're impervious to our efforts, they're just the system can't be manipulated by human knowledge and human action, that would be pessimistic. If we thought that even if things are getting worse, there is the potential by acquiring and applying knowledge that we could shift it and make it better, that would be the kind of defensible optimism that I think Deutsch would advocate and that I, that I, that I would as well. But in either case, I, I don't think any good can come from uh, distorting our picture of reality, keeping pe people ignorant of ways in which the world has improved. Because uh, you know, not only is just accuracy uh, a prerequisite for everything, but uh, a kind of I indiscriminate pessimism, and particularly an ignorant pessimism, could, as I mentioned, lead to fatalism, to saying, well, why, why even bother? We're, we're doomed. Uh, or uh, that it's a matter of, of fate, which indeed was the uh, attitude for most of most people before the Enlightenment, that uh, accidents and misfortunes and famines and, um, uh, and epidemics were beyond human control. They were a matter of God's will, they were a matter of uh, fate, a matter of karma, a matter of, uh, of uh, evil forces. Uh, so um, pessimism itself does not safeguard against complacency. Uh, it could even encourage it. And what I, uh, the opposite of complacency would be the conviction that with knowledge, we could make things better. And the fact that our ancestors made things better would be a kind of empirical confirmation that we live in the kind of universe in which human agency can affect human well-being. Uh, thanks for the conference. I was wondering, don't you see a bit of a tension between the, um, so the fact that, um, a big chunk of the progress that you mentioned has its source in generally uh, left-wing uh, political thought, which I assume you probably count as an anti-enlightenment uh, force, or? Uh... Well, it, um, I, I would say no to each. Um, a lot of the improvements take place from, uh, for example, from, uh, from commerce, from markets, in fact, from capitalism. Uh, say. The, what's happened in China since the death of Mao, what differentiates South Korea from North Korea, what differentiated West Germany from East Germany, uh, the, what differentiated India before, while it was stagnating from, what, uh, from India as, as it is now. Uh, and that would be, if anything, more right or libertarian than it would be uh, left. But I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't say that left is, is uh, anti-enlightenment. Um, that it, it depends on the policy and it depends on whether, the, 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 whether by leftism you mean something like doctrinaire Marxism or more so, something more like liberalism, the, uh, in its, at least in its American sense of uh, advocating reforms uh, and government policies that are uh, intended to improve the well-being of people. Thank you very much for this uh, broad perspective. Uh, I retain three points. Uh, Let's start with one. Yes, no, but it's, it's very simple. The, uh, the progress can be measured. Uh, a progress can be measured. The media do not talk sufficiently about it, and this leaves room to strong identities around beliefs, gods, tribes, ethnics, etc. Thus, you're calling, I understand, for a stronger identification around uh, reason, enlightenment. So my question is, how does the ordinary citizen contribute to this, to this new identity building beyond reading your book? <laughs> yes. Um, well, uh, certainly by Participation in um, political institutions, uh, voting, um, showing up at town meetings, uh, submitting comments to uh, the political representatives, uh, donating money to 
uh, not only to uh, effective charities, but to movements that try to mobilize uh, effective reform and effective change. To also the, uh, uh, I, I mentioned earlier the somewhat mysterious process by which social norms and cultural beliefs change. The fact that the society as a whole becomes more sympathetic to, say, women's equality or, and uh, gay rights. Uh, just in, we all contribute little bits to this massive thing that we call culture just by sharing our opinions, our approval, our disapproval, our likes, our dislikes, our, our retweets. And if people as a whole expressed uh, opinions in the direction of uh, enlightenment values, of reason, of, of humanism, that would play a role even in the parts of progress that a politician can't control, but that uh, uh, apply to the, the culture as a whole. But bo both of those um, more direct, more indirect uh, pathways might be ways in which individuals can contribute. And of course, many individuals can, uh, if they're fortunate enough to be in, in uh, research, can help to develop solutions to problems, to cleaner energy, to longer life, better health, uh, uh, more evidence-based policy. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering if of all of the uh, progressive developments you've described, all of the multiple different kinds of ways in which things are getting better, if any one of them or a small group is a better predictor mm. of all of the others than the others. So yes. which is the thing we should focus on? Or like. Yeah, it's, it, it's a great question and, and one that, um, uh, that, that consumed me in the writing of the book because in, um, what, I, what I tended to find is, in just looking over these data, is that there are some countries where everything seems to go right, where they're prosperous, they're equal, they're women's rights, they have low rates of crime, long lives, they're democratic, they don't get involved in wars. So countries like Denmark and Sweden. And there are other countries where everything seems to go wrong, like Afghanistan or Somalia. The question is, what is it that, what is the causal, in this tangle of intercorrelations, what is the exogenous cause that pushes everything else along, if there is one? And, uh, as best I could determine, and, and, and because we can't do controlled experiments, we can never absolutely prove causation, but uh, a huge one is sheer, sheer prosperity, that societies that are richer actually are um, better off in many other ways. They're more likely to be democratic, less likely to get involved in wars, uh, more likely to care about the environment, uh, higher levels of education and so on. Now it's not a perfect correlation because there are countries that are very rich but are socially and politically backward like uh, many of the Gulf oil states, for example. Uh, uh, and, uh, and wealth is, even though it's probably the biggest or one of the biggest contributors, is not the only one. Another one is, narrowly speaking, education more broadly speaking, in connectivity, information uh, intensity. So countries that have, where people get uh, a lot of education, that translate a lot of books, that have a lot of internet connections, that seem to be open to the, to the flow of information and, and accumulation of knowledge, also tend to uh, prosper in other ways. They tend to have people who are uh, happier, they tend to be less likely to have civil wars, um, and uh, uh, they tend to live longer and other good things in life. So if I, were to, if I were a policymaker, I would emphasize number one and number two, or number two and number one would be just make the country rich and make the country educated. And of course the, the problem is that education and wealth themselves affect each other. So if you're wealthy, you can afford more schools, and if your population is better educated, then that tends to improve the economy. So even there, we don't absolutely know which came first, which was the first domino, but those would be uh, but two. Oh, and of course, health, uh, health would be another one. If your population is sick uh, a lot of the time, then you can't grow economically, and the kids aren't going to go to school if they're uh, at home with uh, pneumonia or diarrhea. So health, health education, uh, prosperity would be the big three. Um, hello, and thank you so much for your conference. It was uh, really inspiring. Um, I wonder, um, like, 
My, my hypothesis on why um, things are um, getting better and better is that we are basically getting better are at uh, explo exploiting um, our environment. Um, and if we look, for example, uh, so you talked about climate change, um, but not really about um, the oil peak. And if we look at the, um, the movement of people thinking uh, of um, how everything may collapse, so we have now a collapsology, um, which study how uh, entire civilizations uh, could collapse. Um, and the hypothesis is that uh, climate change plus um, oil peak could cause um, a collapse of the entire, um, of entire civilizations. And so if we take, for example, just in France, uh, in two decades, uh, we have lost 30% of the birds, 80% uh, of, the, um, of the insects. Um, and uh, for example, in Atlantic, uh, in the Atlantic Ocean, we have lost 90% of the um, big fish. So bi um, biodiversity is really um, plunging. Um, so do you think we can overcome this uh, challenge? Uh, yes, I think, I think we can. That, um, the problem with collapsology, especially as, say, it was uh, made famous by Jared Diamond in his book Collapse, is that, if, if anything, the conclusions that he reaches are, are uh, exactly the wrong ones. The examples of societies that collapse are isolated, simple, technologically primitive societies, like Easter Island, like uh, settlements on the coast of Greenland. Uh, big, rich, science, technologically advanced societies um, despite predictions that they should have collapsed by now, have not collapsed. They're doing fine. Now, it is true that, that if we don't deal with the problem of climate change, there is a high probability of, uh, of, of many negative outcomes. Whether it will lead to collapse or just massive human suffering is kind of moot. In either case, we should prevent it from happening. But it's, I think that has nothing to do with running out of oil. The problem with climate change is not that we're going to run out of oil. If we ran out of oil, that would be very good for the climate. The problem is we're never going to run out of oil because there's lots of oil and we get more and more clever about uh, how, to, how to find it, including uh, uh, fracking, for example, and on oil sands. So these are two different problems and I think they should not be conflated. The, um, I think the way to think of it is not that human progress depends on um, exploiting resources in the sense of uh, that the more progress, the more pollution, the more uh, species uh, extinctions, but that um, the that societies with progress tend to uh, follow a U-shaped trajectory, that as they grow out of extreme poverty, the only thing that counts is prosperity, and the environment uh, is, is irrelevant. People just don't care about it. But as societies get wealthier, as their citizens become more concerned with the environment, as their technology advances, we figure out how to get more and more of what we want with less and less harm to the environment. And I, I showed you two graphs, three graphs in which that is uh, the case. The fact that in the United States, people drive twice as many miles, but the five major air pollutants have gone down. That the amount of oil shipped by sea has shot up, the amount of oil spilled has gone down. And that the amount of CO2 produced per unit of uh, GDP uh, reaches a peak and then uh, ha has declined. Now again, I don't want to, here is a case where I really don't want to encourage complacency because as, the, uh, uh, as I mentioned and as one of the questions reiterated, we have to get the carbon intensity of the economy not just lower but to zero. Uh, and to negative for that matter. But that itself is a technological problem that uh, a society that is uh, knowledge intensive can solve. And indeed, there are pathways to what's called deep decarbonization, that is getting to zero, uh, that have been, uh, been laid out. There's nothing inherent in the laws of thermodynamics or the engine of progress that says that it must come at the expense of the environment because the problem of getting what humans want without harming the environment is itself a problem that can be solved. Uh, I think part of the solution will come from fourth generation uh, nuclear power, from small modular reactors that uh, produce abundant energy with zero emissions and that are much more cheaper and uh, safer than the generations that we have now, possibly combined with um, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, that is growing fuel and then capturing the carbon when we burn it, 
and that could be carbon negative, possibly with technologies that uh, actively use energy to suck CO2 out of the atmosphere, that uh, for, for uh, fisheries, um, there have been rebounds when a fishery applies uh, sustainable practices instead of just letting every uh, fisherman, uh, fisher, uh, fish as much as possible, then you have a tragedy of the commons. But with intelligent regulation, fisheries can be uh, protected and then can, can rebound, fish can come back. So we do need those policies. It won't happen unless we have the policies and the technology, but there isn't anything that's inherent to progress that means that it is, uh, uh, by definition, unsustainable. I shall, I'll just add that the, two weeks ago, the Nobel Prize in Economics uh, went to two people who advocate this kind of thinking. Uh, uh, William Nordhaus was the economist who probably first came up with the idea of a carbon tax so that millions of decisions are made with, the, uh, with carbon emissions in mind. And then Paul Romer uh, came up with the idea that what causes increases in prosperity is not stuff in the ground, but ideas. And because ideas, uh, as cognitive psychologists would insist, can explore a potentially infinite space of, by combining simple ideas to form complex ideas, uh, ultimately, human um, uh, increases in prosperity are governed much more by our ideas, our technologies, our formulas, our theories, than by how much oil or coal there is in the ground. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. That was very inspiring. Um, you argue very convincingly that Enlightenment values um, have helped improve progress on a, a number of metrics. Um, and the, uh, the graph all go to from, say, 0 to 95%, 99% out of the way. Uh, do you feel uh, confident that those same values can help us get the last 1% or the last 5%, say? Uh, or is it a different scale that requires uh, different modes of thinking? Yes, it, it very much depends on the, uh, on the scale. A lot of them are, are not percentages, like, say, human lifespan, uh, for example. Uh, from 30 to, to 70 or 80 in developed countries. I guess in theory, we could live to 100, 150, 200, 250. So there's no mathematical limit. I do suspect that there are biological limits, but we haven't reached them, uh, them, them yet. Likewise, prosperity, it's um, GDP per capita is not a, a scale from 0 to 100%. Um, nonetheless, this is not to deny that in some cases, uh, there, it, there may be exponential increases in difficulty or uh, cost for additional increments in well-being. And that's why even though I very strongly believe in progress, I very strongly don't believe in the singularity. Uh, the idea that well-being will, will shoot up exponentially, we'll all live to a thousand, we'll be immortal, we'll upload our minds to the cloud. Uh, we'll have infinite energy and so on. There, there I'm skeptical for that reason, that, that uh, it may be harder and harder to get the, uh, the last few increments. Okay, thank you very much, Steve, for this great thank talk. You. Thank you.